quick overview of paper two. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold, so sorry if I sound more nasal or uh, mumbly with my accent than normal, but um, I just sort of go through these questions. This uh, is going to be hopefully 15 minutes, um, just going through question three mainly, but also an overview of the assessment objectives for this paper. Students tend to perform worse in this paper than, than any other English paper, literature or language, so it's something that we need to focus on as we're revising. Here's the breakdown of the language part of the course, the reading part of the language course. Um, so both exam papers, the, the reading sections. Um, as you'll see, the AOs, the assessment objectives, are all quite different. Um, they're worth different amounts. AO2 is the one that the students seem to be obsessed with at the moment, uh, language and structure. If you find yourself writing about language and structure in every single question, you're not doing the right thing. The great thing about English is that every exam every year will have the same AOs for the same questions. So all you need to do is get your head around what the questions are requiring you to do and how to approach each of the AOs and you'll be in a really good position for the exam. Let's just quickly run through paper two and which question requires you um, to talk about which AO. So question one and two are both AO1 questions, um, basically finding information and finding quotes to back up the information. Question three in red there, it's worth 15 marks, it's an AO2 question, that's our language and structure, and that's what we'll be talking about today in this video, just going up to question three. Question four is back to AO1. Uh, question five, AO2, it's the, it's the last AO2 question in the, in the paper. It's not worth many marks, but it does require you to find uh, an example of language and structure. Question six is a 15 mark question, it's our only AO4 question, and it requires you to evaluate um, how an author has done something successfully. Um, that's worth 15 marks as well. So just as much as the question three. For some reason, students seem to be focused on the question three AO2 skills, but sort of overlooking the, the question six AO4 skills. Question 7a is only worth six marks, but it is an AO1 question and part of question 7a and 7b, which together are worth 20 marks. 7b is our uh, AO3 question, which is our comparison question, worth 14 marks. So just an overview of the paper and the timings, uh, questions one to three are all to do with text A. So if you give yourself 25 minutes for that, um, that's including reading the text and, and doing some annotations and highlighting. That's uh, 19 marks, questions one, two, and three. Obviously what you're learning and uh, annotating for text A will be useful for questions 7A and 7B as well. So a bit of time reading and annotating uh, is a good investment, but give yourself 25 minutes. Text B, another 25 minutes, that's questions four, five, and six. 17 marks in total and again that's including reading time for those 25 minutes and the end uh, 7a and 7b um, and it, it's ridiculous how many students um, rush through question 7a and 7b or um, don't actually answer the question at all um, that section is worth 20 marks so you need to make sure that you give yourself 25 minutes for that section of the exam before you begin text one, um, just remember, uh, again, the great thing about English is you always know that question three is going to ask you about language and structure and how language and structure interest and engage the reader. So as you read this text, you know what they're going to ask you. You don't even need to look at the question. And um, just remember that you need to be sensitive to those things as you're going through. Interviewing students who did really well last year in this paper, um, what was really interesting for me is that uh, many of them tended to spend longer reading the extract than other students. So it wasn't because they were very, very fast writers necessarily or um, really thoughtful or had this uh, amazing strategy. What they tended to do was just take time to read and absorb and think about and remember the extract. And I think that's really crucial. Um, so obviously you've got to be careful about time in the exam, and that's why practicing reading and, and being very comfortable reading um, uh, is very, very important for this exam. But you need to read it and understand it and have thoughts about it, have a think about what is being said and do you agree with that and what's interesting to you about the extract. And that's going to help you for, for question three, but it's also going to help you for question seven A and B, because as you read the next extract, you're going to have to remember the first extract and be able to connect them and uh, work with them that way. So taking time to read, not just the start of the extract, but the entire extract and think about what the goal is, is a really, really important part of this exam paper. And I know it's hard, it's gonna be stressful, you'll be in the exam hall and all on your own and, and, and that sort of thing, but it's really important that you take that time to engage in the extract. 
give yourself about five minutes to read the extract and do use those highlighters and annotate. Um, I tell students to try and really use sophisticated language from the outset. So as they annotate, um, don't just restate what's happening in the, in the text. Um, or don't just label, you know, verb, adjective, uh, whatever. You also need to be able to uh, connect to interesting vocab with maybe what North is trying to do or the emotional response to the piece. And also look for combinations. One-off language features aren't necessarily useful to you as you're discussing language. You should be, be able to talk about how language and structure interact, um, but a, a, a range of language features, how they work together. And usually an author isn't just thinking, I'm going to use this one verb here to have this impact. The verb will also connect to uh, the adverb or the adjective or any imagery that's being used, um, things that are repeated throughout the extract, and there's a cooperation between all of them uh, working together. So do look for those things. And again, if, if you find those things, and if you take your time to find those things, these are things that you can reuse uh, later on, or you might want to compare to text B. So it is really worth your while taking that time. I wanted to use a real uh, text, so this is from um, from the exam board, just one of the sample ones that we've had, and we used it for a, a walking, talking mock at, at school, um, just to give some tangible examples of, of actual language and things that might come up in the in the text. I don't know if you want to pause uh, the video or um, read it through. I don't think it's probably necessary to read everything. And really sorry for any teachers out there that were wanting to use uh, this text or this paper for, um, for for any mocks or practice exams. Just remember that you're the reader. Um, you're not the only reader. There are other readers, but you, as you read, your feelings and your responses and your thoughts about the text are really important. So um, have a think about how you're responding. If you're responding in a certain way, um, uh, then it's probably a result of what the author's deliberately doing. So have a look for why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And you do need to have feelings as you read the text. Um, you're not racing through trying to find answers in an exam paper. This is a reading exam. Your job is to read and to think and to feel about what you're reading. Now, interest and engage is a, is a, a funny phrase, I think, um, because there's so many things that interest us in a text. Um, if something's familiar to us, uh, that interests us. Um, we're engaged if we feel sorry for a character or get angry about a character. So I wouldn't be too limited when you hear this interest and engage. And actually, I don't even think you need to use the word interest and engage over and over again, um, as long as you're being very, very clear about the effect of language. So how do I show you what sort of things we should be annotating and looking for in a text? Here's the opening paragraph, and I just thought I'd look at three examples of language. Um, the first one here is this repetition of he tells, she tells, bridey tells. Clearly here, uh, McCourt's trying to create a sense of, of gossip. And if we're sensitive to that, we should be able to pick that up very, very easily. Um, everyone's talking about this um, husband uh, and father. Um, Malachi McCourt is, is doing all these things in England and news is getting back about it. So it's a very uncomfortable scenario. So again, that discomfort is something that engages us, but just a sense of gossip. So I've put there on the right hand side, um, the repetition throughout the opening sentences creates a sense that. Now repetition is both a language and a structure device, so that's great for us for question three. Also just generally speaking, that second sentence, or third sentence, sorry, in the extract, or maybe fourth, we've got a really long, long, long sentence there. And I guess uh, there's a feeling there created that there's a lot of talk going on. It's non-stop. Um, do you know when people gossip and they talk really, really quickly? Um, and I think that's definitely a, a, an impression that I'm getting. That interests me, that sense of gossip. It, it makes me uh, think that there's something exciting being spoken about, and it sounds very familiar to me. Um, also, he's a regular disgrace, so he is doesn't stop if he doesn't stop this bloody nonsense that expression is idiomatic it's very um, much it's not a quote it's not um, uh, speech in the text um, but the narrative has those idioms because it's trying to create a sense of um, someone speaking and that's something that I will associate with maybe uh, a, a Irish culture uh, maybe the sort of sense that people are judging whatever it is uh, they're definitely things that I want to uh, be mentioning and talking about. And um, I don't have to stop and do an essay plan to do that. I can just notice these things when I'm reading. I can be sensitive to it, and I can jot some things down in the margins as I read. Another way of looking at it is um, having a think about the goal of the piece as you read. Um, clearly, there's a lot um, that's being expressed about the father here, um, or the husband, Maliki. 
um, and just from that opening paragraph, um, we really get a sense of these things on the left-hand side. So how useless he is, how embarrassing he is, how he's really a public disgrace, all of those things. And just have a look at that vocab, um, uh, embarrassment, selfishness, um, the, the difficulties with alcohol, has no sense of responsibility to, to a wife or a family. These are sort of the vocabs, uh, sorry, the examples of vocab that should really be coming up in your writing. And they're the kind of examples of vocab that you should be annotating or at least sort of remembering and they should be finding their way into your writing. If we're not thinking about the father in this context, we're definitely thinking about the mother. And there's very much a sense of embarrassment, um, desperation, um, of how difficult the situation she's in, um, how resourceful she is midway through that extract and later on. Um, her sort of sense of panic, um, she's rushing around trying to solve this problem. And also she's got a lot to manage, if not just from the gossip and the people who are judging her, but also her own children and trying to fund uh, her family and keep them surviving. So absolutely Frank McCourt wanted to create that sense about his mother and uh, create this sort of sense of sympathy for the mother and also a sense of how useless the father is. So look at another way, uh, not only are we talking about um, those uh, characterizations and feelings about the father and the mother, we're also thinking about um, concepts. And it's really important, I think, um, uh, that we bring these concepts into our text. So it doesn't take uh, a lot of focus and, and, and study to figure out these concepts that are coming in. So um, as we discuss and write about the language and the text, these concepts should find their way in. So gossip, uh, there is humor there. Um, there's a, a torment um, that's finding its way there for the mother, um, an intense sense of frustration. There's the concept of financial hardship and hopelessness and loneliness. Um, there's no one there to help. Um, what are we going to do about this? Um, that is certainly something which is coming through. We should practice our writing style um, constantly, particularly for questions that were the longer questions. Um, Make sure that our openings are very, very strong as we write our paragraphs. Um, use that sophisticated vocab um, straight away, um, early in paragraphs. I think opening sentences are really important. Um, so make sure that from the start of each paragraph, the analysis is, is going well um, and is, is strong. That's something to practice when you get given practice questions at home. Um, not just to get to the point when you find the quote, but actually get to the point straight away. Um, one thing that my students have started doing quite well, I think, this year is talking about language features in a much more fluent way. So um, using a feature, but actually talking about it as, as an adjective. So um, talking about a metaphor, but also saying that something's metaphorical. Talking about repetition, but also talking about something being repetitive or repetitious. Um, they could be discussing a short sentence. But, but also talking about the brevity of the, the, the writing. So um, try and build the technical vocab into your analysis as well as just labeling um, terms. An example of a way students often will start this question, and it's usually because they haven't planned this properly, they start off saying there are many ways the author interests and engages their reader in the text. Now, that is not really an analytical statement. Um, it's kind of just a a really sluggish start to an analysis and it's a waste of time in an exam. Instead actually the opening claim should really um, uh, make a statement about the language and the structure and uh, an implication about what the effect of that is. So um, instead the organization of sentences and the repetition of phrases immediately impress a sense of gossip and embarrassment onto readers as they hear about the narrator's father. So here we've got techniques uh, multiple techniques and we've got a sense of the effect um, on readers and the opening statement before we even get into anything specific so that's the difference between sharp sophisticated writing and kind of gluggy uh, boring a little bit confused writing I'm not sure what sort of structure you should be following for this exam um, uh, this this question uh, I can't tell you how many paragraphs to write because it, again it depends how much time you've got and what your style of writing is I would just go for um, a, a, writing a chunk whether it's a couple of paragraphs or not, on the beginning part of this text and a chunk on the second part of the text. Final bit of advice is avoid these statements. I shouldn't have to explain to you why. Um, your goal is to be analytical and thoughtful and you need to be very, very specific about specifically why um, techniques produce uh, effects and not just the obvious effects.